how do I put myself on the sidelines so that when all this goes down, I'm sitting safely on a stack of money, liquid money outside the banking system, which is gold, outside the banking system, outside the financial system, eating popcorn, watching this thing go down. I feel bad for all the people who haven't gotten in position. I don't think it's too late, but I think it's, it's late in the game. Hi, and welcome to this video. I am honored to have Russ Gray with me once again. Russ, how are you doing? Great, Mike. Great. Happy to be here. Excited to talk with you. Excellent. You know, uh, we were just talking before prepping with the, for this video and uh, the subject of uh, the Federal Reserve and these the, the emergency uh, lending that facility that they came out with last year. They've raised rates on that to sort of shut off some arbitrage. And you had some great comments and some great comments on value. And we are also <clears throat> up at record highs in real estate in some areas again. So uh, give me some of your take on this. Well, you know, I think you and I are both like news junkies. I think that anybody who really cares about what's going on is looking for what I call clues in the news. And so we're out there all the time scanning the headlines, trying to figure out what is here and it's funny, I have a Sherlock Holmes hat and a little pipe and, and every once in a while I'll do a segment. I call it clues in the news, you know, and and uh, I remember when I was a kid, I used to watch this old show Columbo and uh, pay, played by Peter Falk. And uh -huh. uh, he was this bumbling, you know, detective. And he was so unassuming that the people he was trying to gather information on would, uh, you know, just trust him and talk to him. And then the guys that and were they, pretty, and they also assumed that he was just an idiot. <laughs> they just assumed he was an idiot. And so they underestimated him uh -huh. and they weren't really paying attention to his movements. And he was gathering, you know, the information to get in position to get his, you know, uh, evidence to to charge the people or whatever and then of course the producers of the show need to put drama in it and they they're misdirecting you so the person who's innocent uh the people who are innocent are all kind of like playing clue when you're a kid's like who did it and you're and, and you're giving little clues like maybe they're guilty i don't know and then the person who's innocent is kind of hiding off to the corner so if you kind of look at what's going on in the world right now and you're watching the news you have to ask yourself, based on what the Fed is doing and what the Fed is saying, uh, you know, people like you, people like Jim Rickards, there's all kinds of smart people out there that are watching and going, oh, the Fed just doesn't get it. The Fed just doesn't get it. You know, they're, they don't understand the Peter Schiff. They don't understand this. They don't understand that. They're making this mistake. And you got to ask yourself, are these people truly that incompetent? Are they really incompetent. I mean, when you look at the Fed, do you see incompetence? Well, uh, personally, uh, you know, I've, I've stated that uh, these are a bunch of very, very smart people. Uh, if, if they are this dumb, they don't belong in their job. Uh, if they aren't this dumb, then they're complicit in all of these evil things that they're doing and they belong in jail. That's exactly my point, right? Anybody who's paying attention pretty soon figures out these people probably aren't stupid. And everything that we are all out there saying publicly, they know. In fact, I got a chance to see Alan Greenspan speak at the New Orleans Investment Conference a few years ago. And he goes, you know, all the things you guys talk about, they all know that. They all know that. And so then I'm like, okay, well, if they know that and they're doing it anyway, they must be doing it on purpose. Mm -hmm. And so then you, you start to watch the movies. I don't want to listen to what they say. I try to look at what they do. And of course, we just watched them raise interest rates. And I don't think anybody with who understands the basics of finance and the way the markets work thinks that you can jack interest rates up that high in terms of a percentage of change. Because people think, oh, it's only 5%. It's not that big of a deal or five and a quarter. But when you're starting at a basis of 25 basis points, well, and you go ten, from point 10, actually, 10 basis points was the low. Okay. Well, just do the math from 0.25 to 5.25. Uh-huh. Right. That, that, that's like 20 X. And so, you know, you go back to Paul Volcker who raised interest rates from 8% to, you know, 18, that was like two and a half X. So this is way more severe in terms of the shock to the financial system. And so like, what does that look like? Well, it blew up 
bank balance sheets. I'm sure you were talking about it. I know I was in the beginning of 2023, the Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, all the way taking a Credit Suisse. That's a big bank. And all these banks' balance sheets imploded. And out of that, to your opening comment, was born the bank term funding program, which is basically the life support system to get the banks back on their feet. And if you've been following, like I have, you know that it has been record drawdowns on that system uh, almost ever since it was uh, conceived. And now it's scheduled to terminate in a couple months here, I think in the middle of March. And uh, there's some news. I think you had shared an article uh, on that that kind of triggered that conversation. Do, do you have that headline? Oh, sure. Um, let me see. The headline, I'm just going to read it. I don't have it set up to share. Fed raises rate on emergency loan program to stop arbitrage. Uh, bank term funding program will expire on March 11th as planned. Banks see higher rates to borrow effective immediately. And so um, there, there was an arbitrage to be, and a lot of banks took advantage of that arbitrage. Now, you had some comments on that that I found very interesting. Well, yeah, if you think about it, the Fed, knowing fully what they were doing, jacked interest rates up, knowing fully that they would blow up balance sheets throughout the financial system. So it could be a controlled demolition of the financial system. We can talk about what the motives might have been because, you know, I think some of them are known if you're paying attention. In fact, i give you one example. Donald Trump just came out recently and said, hey, if you, you know, I'm elected president. There's not going to be a central bank digital currency. And I think that could be one of the agendas. You collapse the financial system and you replace the currency with your CBDC. And there's a whole lot of reasons why people who love their freedom and privacy aren't about that. But to get there, you got to blow up the financial system. Well, the banks are their buddies. So it's like, okay, well, if I'm going to blow up the financial system, I'm going to blow up the banks. I'm going to create a special uh, lifeline to the banks called this bank term funding program. And I'm going to let them earn free money. And that's what the arbitrage is. Free money is I can borrow from this bank term funding program at a certain rate and I can turn right around and invest it in, in a similar safe investment with the Fed and end up with a positive spread. And so I, yeah, if you knew you could borrow money, say, at 3% and earn 5%, how much 3% money do you want to borrow? <laughs> An infinite amount. <laughs> all of it. I want to borrow it. all of it. And so you see banks that are busy, uh, their balance sheets have imploded. And they're creating big loan loss reserves because they know the economy is weak. They know the consumer is tapped. They know bankruptcies, corporate and individual, are increasing. They know all that. They see it before anybody because the payments start getting missed. They see it all. They know. And so there, Bank of America and a couple months ago announced record earnings. At the same time, they increased their loan loss reserves. Well, where did those record earnings come from? <laughs> those record earnings came from free arbitrage, right? And so now they're living off their P&L. They, they, they get all these profits and they're cutting, they're closing branches or cutting staff. You see a lot of layoffs happening yeah. because they're making more money just doing this arbitrage and they're bolstering their balance sheets at the same time. They're preparing for more defaults. And so when you know how to look at what's going on in the financial system, it gives you clues kind of about what's happening. And apparently we'll see, maybe the Fed thinks, okay, guys, we've, we've propped you up enough. You're back on your feet. We're going to turn off that program and maybe because it's an election year and it's going to get scrutinized. I don't know. I'm not that smart. Uh, waiting to see. It's a very exciting time. I'm probably the most exciting time of my adult life uh, in terms of what's going on in the financial system and what's going on in the political system and what's going on in geopolitics and the ability for people like us to have these kind of conversations and share them with all the people that are listening unprecedented in human history. So exciting to be a part of it and just trying to interpret what's going on and figure out how can I get out of the center? You know, we, the last time I was on the show, we talked about my experience in 2008. I was in the mortgage business, uh, brokering loans, high leveraged real estate, investing for equity, not cash flow, and running my entire life and my entire business with no cash reserves. Everything was credit. When the credit markets imploded, it was single point failure. Everything died. I was at the epicenter. And I thought to myself, after that happened, how do I put myself on the sidelines so that when all this goes down, I'm sitting safely on a stack of money, liquid money outside the banking, which is gold, 
outside the banking system, outside the financial system, eating popcorn, watching this thing go down. And I think for anybody that's been following you over the years and have taken your advice, they're in that position, which makes this an even more exciting time. I feel bad for all the people who haven't gotten in position. I don't think it's too late, but I think it's, it's late in the game. And it's time, if you haven't, to, in my opinion, again, I don't give financial advice. I'm not that smart. I could just tell you, knowing what I know now after what I've been through, uh, I think the safest place to be is safely off to the side of this financial system, uh, waiting to see how either this controlled dem uh, demolition and or great reset into CBDC or whatever, or whether it is just, you know, a clown show and these guys are just don't know what they're doing and they're going to drive off the cliff either way. <laughs> either whether it's on purpose or by accident destination's the same and all the clues are there maybe they'll yeah. figure it out and i hope they do i hope they do for all the people who aren't prepared but i think the responsibility we have the things we actually have control over is we can be prepared and be strong in our communities so that if things break and really get bad we're in a position of strength like you are i mean where you live i mean you're in a great position you can help a lot of people if and when that day comes yeah, you know, um, up on my farm, we're trying to make sure that there's no single points of failure. We've got redundant internet and we've got, uh, we're all on solar. We're completely off the grid. And we've got our own water and, and food and everything else. So it's um, uh, that, you know, we're beefing up for that because I've never seen a time in history where there's so many different threats, so many things coming at us at once. And uh, this, uh, the potential of some sort of uh, currency system catastrophe, as uh, Ludwig von Mises called it, um, is so great right now. And you're you're pointing out that you know maybe this is on purpose. <laughs> it's very interesting. Well, and I mean, so I, I think it has to be, and I think I think the the misdirection to me, is the stock market. Uh, anybody that follows what happened when the Fed really became active in the markets and the birth of the activist Fed was Alan Greenspan when he was nominated. And uh, th that really, in, in the 1987 stock market crash, and I happened to follow it very closely because I was a registered representative selling securities at the time, 27 years old, didn't really know what I was doing thought I was doing the right thing for people. My father was a high-tech entrepreneur, took his company public, uh, happened to go public June of 1987, and he was in a 120-day lockout period. And so he had all this founder stock. Uh, and then the stock market crashed on October 19th, 1987. His equity got wiped out. He was margined. They sold his stock and he lost everything almost in a matter of days. Wow. And then he got stuck with a big tax bill that cost him his real estate and ultimately the loss because he conflated his self-worth with his net worth. Hi, I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for subscribing and mention that if you'd like to help our channel, please consider my company, goldsilver.com, the next time you buy precious metals. We're one of the most trusted names in the industry. Our prices are sharp, delivery is fast, and we have an insider's program where you find out exactly what I'm doing with my own investments. Thanks for making goldsilver.com your dealer. And now back to the video. Ultimately the loss because he conflated his self-worth with his net worth. Um, it, it took away his mojo. It kind of, it, it, he was never the same man again. And it was tragic because he'd worked so hard. He was in the semiconductor business. He had created jobs and technology. It raised yeah. more capital for a startup semiconductor company than anybody else in the history of Silicon Valley up to that time. And then he just lost it all. And it was because he did not understand the game he was in when he stepped into the casinos of Wall Street. And right now, you, you're being told this, the economy is good because the stock market is at all time highs. Yeah, and, and, and I, 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 you know, I don't, I don't believe that's true. People who are looking at the wrong gauges, you know, they're they're looking at the red pill or the 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 blue pill, uh, to use the matrix analogy, and not the red pill. And, and I think that people right now who are speculating on stock price in this market or even real estate prices in this market um, are, are, are treading dangerously. Yeah. And there's a difference between speculation and investing. Kiyosaki has been singing out of that songbook for 20 years. And I just still don't think enough people get the message. Yeah. You know, um, I've, I, I believe 
that we are in for global financial crisis 2024, that uh, we are going to have something enormous coming at us. And if they are able to hold this thing together through the elections, that just means we're going to be <laughs> in for a worse global financial crisis 2025. Uh, that it, it that something absolutely all the evidence points to something absolutely happening uh, this year, most likely or next, if they're able to hold this thing together. But it's going to be something absolutely enormous. I think probably bigger than the 2008 crisis. And, and uh, what you're talking about, the scenarios you're talking about, fit this perfectly. Yeah. Well, again, I think anybody paying attention can see it. Uh, I often try to explain to people because. Uh, People who are concerned about the um, foundational, the infrastructure, they understand the system. Peter Schiff, you know, we joke all the time. Peter's predicted 19 of the last two recessions, and people give him a hard time about that. And Kiyosaki, you know, the kind of the people that are the realists who understand the mechanics of the system just realize the old adage that something that is unsustainable won't sustain. If it can't go on, it won't. Yes, and, but you and, don't know how long it'll go on. But you don't stopped. know when. You don't <laughs> right. know when. So right. the trend, the the trends are hard to resist. <clears throat> you can't. It's you know the old adage: investing is the trend is your friend, right? You're not going to beat the trend. The trend is going to be the trend. The dollar has a, a almost perfect track record since its inception of losing value consistently decade over decade. It, it, it's, a, it's a perfect track record. And fiat currencies, I don't need to tell you or your audience, have a perfect track record of failing Yes. at some right. point in time. That is an undeniable, irresistible trend. I mean, maybe this is the one time in human history it won't happen. I don't know. But if you just play in the probabilities, you need to be prepared for that. The problem is a trend goes along for a while, and then one day it becomes an event. And the mistake people make is they try to... They try to time or predict the event. And then the people who hear that, and then when they miss the date, oh, the, they must be wrong about the trend. No. Mm -mm. Trend, is, trend is real. The timing, we just don't know the timing. So you have to be right. in a position so that better early than late, right? Once it happens, once you've gone over, you know, if it's a river going down the, the deal and you haven't prepared, then when that ship or that boat finally goes over the waterfall, which is the event, it's too late. You, you can't get back yeah. up. So that, and, that's really what you're all about always, forever. These things always take everybody by surprise as well. If you remember long-term capital management, nobody knew about that except for long-term capital management, the Federal Reserve and the, uh, just a few others, Securities and Exchange Commission and so on. And so, you know, over, over a weekend, uh, they are... Uh, having meetings that just do not end. They're, they're up 24 hours a day trying to hold together the global financial system, the monetary system with their bare hands. And they figured something out. But we were within days of uh, the entire financial system freezing up. And then the same thing, same story with 2008. Do you remember uh, waking up in one morning and Lehman was, was gone? <laughs> and I, mean, I was in the mortgage business back then. I mean, every day we were getting texts and, and emails from uh, notifications that companies that we had done business with big companies sponsored big conventions and spent all this money and they were bringing in, you know, Troy Aikman and these big stars and it was just, just spending money hand over fist. And then like the next day they're out of business. Yeah. Right, right. It it just it always takes everybody by surprise. It's nothing that you can time or predict. You have to be prepared for it to happen tomorrow, uh, because someday that's exactly what will happen. <laughs> well, and I think that's that's really um, the business you've been in for the longest time is warning people about what's going on, explaining the fundamental flaw of the system, which is money is borrowed into existence. You have to pay back that debt with interest. The money to pay the interest doesn't exist. So the only way to have that money is to borrow more money. And it's no different than if you don't have any real income and you're borrowing money, you have to continue to borrow money to make your payments. Well, we all know how that ends. And when you see the hockey stick on the graphs, anybody can go to the Federal Reserve, you know, St. Louis Fed website and pull up the hockey sticks on government debt, government debt service. You can see this thing is exponential. The danger of exponentiality is that um, that last move is brutal. 
Uh, I've heard it said, and I think Chris yeah. Martinson got it from somebody else, but you've probably heard the water dropper thing. You know, you put a, a dropper in a, yeah. a, 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 right, in a, in a stadium and it's a magic dropper and two drops, four drops. It doubles every time. Or yeah, we, we animated were... that with Chris Martinson narrating it. Uh, I Perfect. It back in 2010, I think. And then uh, we did an anime. It's in one of the episodes of Hidden Secrets of Money. Perfect. Uh, well, people should yeah. go back and watch that because that last drop goes from half full where you don't think you're in trouble to overflowing in one. Yeah. Minute. In one sec, huh? One, one second in, or one minute. I can't it, remember. In right. one move. I mean, in whatever, in whatever move, the right. cycle are, yeah. whatever the cycle is the next move. Yeah. And so that's the danger of exponentiality. You know, it's just like in, in building a, a business. If you understand, Hey, if I can get a hundred customers to refer 10 each, I can go from a hundred to a thousand. If I can get a thousand customers for 10 each, I can go from a thousand to 10,000. If I can get those people to go 10 each, I can go from a thousand to, you know, a hundred thousand or a million. I mean, just, it doesn't take many iterations till the numbers are just ridiculous. So why every Ponzi scheme always fails. This is a Ponzi scheme and it's going to fail. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so you want to be eating popcorn and watching this with a, uh, and open a beer or pour a glass of wine maybe <laughs> and sit on the sidelines and not be part of the entertainment for the people that are eating popcorn because yeah i, I think there's two safe havens that yeah. that in in my opinion again i don't give financial advice i'm not that smart but the, you know what i think uh just from observing people that survived 2008 and did really well and um just kind of looking at history i think there's two things number one real money if you're in real money, which is gold and silver, you're outside the banking system. You don't have any counterparty risk. You're the financial system. It falls apart. Doesn't matter to you. Most of the pricing in those things has nothing to do with credit. So if the credit markets implode, it actually helps you. If you go back and look historically, when the credit market broke in 2008, gold went up. And, and I think the same thing started to happen here. Gold has been up as the credit markets have been more fragile. So that's kind of typical. It's the same thing to do with the interest rates because you think, oh, the interest rates are up. Therefore, gold should be down because it doesn't give a yield. That's not it. Interest rates are up because the credit market's breaking and gold is responding to trouble in the credit market. People don't understand that, like don't get it, but that's what's going on. So having real money and real savings. The second one is investing for income. This is what Ken McElroy did. You know, you you came and spoke at our collective inner circle event uh, in Bahamas, which was a ton of fun. And uh, George Gammon, Jason Hartman, Robert Helms, Ken McElroy, and myself have this mastermind group. And we talk about this kind of stuff all the time. But Kenny is a cash flow investor. So going right. through, he, he invests in apartments. And so when you're yeah, investing he started with nothing and now he flies around in a private jet. So I, I got a chance to what? fly. Yeah, yeah. Very fun. <laughs> And he's just the most unassuming guy. He's bright though. He's bright, right. but he invests for income. And the thing is in, in a scenario, and I've showed you a chart and we can talk about that if you want to, but, um, and I did it with both real estate. I can talk real estate bonds and stock prices all kind of in the same chart because the principle. Go ahead and show us that. that uh, chart. Okay. You, can one. you, can you pull that up there, Mr. Producer? Here we go. Okay. So I know people are like, oh my God, math. But math is important. I have a saying, do the math and the math will tell you what to do. And the math is the path. In this case, the math is the way to interpret what's going on. So when you hear the stock market at an all-time high, maybe a share price at $100 a share over here, and the price to earnings ratio is 40, uh, 40 which means that uh, it's the share price is selling for 40 times earnings. So to find out what the earnings are, you divide the uh, share price by the P.E. ratio and get the earnings. And since the share price is what everybody's bidding, the P.E. ratio moves up and down. But the earnings pretty much stay stable. Companies' earnings don't vacillate a lot. Well-run companies produce predictable results. They hope they're trending up. And if they can grow steadily, that's great. But if you were to look at it the way a real estate investor does is if I buy an apartment building for $100, not that you could, and it generated $2.50 of net operating income, uh, you know, rent coming in, less expenses paid out, not counting your mortgage, you'd have a capitalization rate or cap rate of 2.5%. There's not a real estate investor around that's really going to want to buy an, a real estate, uh, a piece of property for 2.5%, especially with inflation. And so if you buy a $100 stock that's at a, trading at a 40 PE, it means you're buying $2.50 for your $100. That's a 2.5% cap rate. And so people who are doing that, and there are millions of them, 
they're not investing for income. They're investing, hoping somebody will come along and pay a higher price. And they have no control over that. So that's speculation. Now, people can make a lot of money gambling. People can make a lot of money in speculation, but you have to understand there's huge risk. And what's the risk? The risk is that the interest rates go up. And when interest rates go up, then people demand a higher capitalization rate on their investments. And so this is true in bonds too. If you buy a $100 bond and it has a 2.5% coupon, it's giving you $2.50 of yield. If interest rates go up to 5%, Nobody is going to pay you $100 for $2.50. They're only going to pay you $50. Well, from an equity standpoint, your $100 bond portfolio just went down to $50. Now go back to our earlier conversation. We've yeah, got the, the bank. banks out there holding these bonds on their balance sheet, and the Fed is jacking them interest rate, destroying their equity. And so what they had to do is hand them an easy path to income to get them over the hump. And that's what's been going on. Um, because otherwise the Fed would have to buy all those bonds like they did in the great financial crisis and print a bunch of money. And then that would freak everybody out about the dollar at a time when interest is, all, I mean, uh, inflation is already high. So how do we shrink our balance sheet and yet let some air out? And they had to do it with interest rates. So, but, but the point that I want to make here is if you're investing in stock market, when the stock market's at an all time high, hoping that the PE ratio is going to go even higher. Uh, that's not the thing to look at. What you have to look at is ask yourself, does this company have a chance for his earnings to grow as fast as you need them to grow? Are companies expanding their earnings 20% a year? A lot of mark because we're in a soft economy. Right. Okay. Yeah. Or, or they are through cost cutting, which isn't sustainable. You can't cut your way to prosperity. You have to grow your way to prosperity. It's true in your life. You know, if you have a fixed income in your job and you're cutting expenses to have more savings, you can only cut so far before you don't have a home and you don't have food. Same thing in business. If you don't grow your revenue and all you're doing is cutting expenses, pretty soon you just cut your expenses all the way till you're not in business anymore. So more revenue is always the answer. But the point here is in the same environment where a share price based on what's going on with interest rates and then the resulting willingness of investors to purchase that income. Uh, potentially the air could go in your stock market portfolio from a hundred dollars a share all the way to $25 a share in a 10% environment, right? So you lose 75% of your equity in that environment. So if you're investing over here for asset prices, buy low, sell high, which is what 99% of the stock market investors are doing. And you get your 401k balance sheet and you think, oh, I'm so excited because I have all this fake equity on my balance sheet. I'm rich. Therefore I'll go into debt. What you, my opinion, again, I don't give financial advice. The people I've seen be successful going through horrendous crashes are people who are focused on this. And notice that this can be very stable. And if you want to have a stable, resilient portfolio, it's based on this. This is going to go up and down depending on what goes on over here. And you have no control over these things. This if you're running the property, you have control over. If you're running the business, you have control over. If you know how to look at a company, look at their, you know, like Warren Buffett looks at the, the, the business, the business model, the management team, the competition. This is where Warren Buffett invests in the stock market. This is where Ken McElroy invests in real estate. People who are over here investing in real estate and stocks playing the equity game uh, are in danger depending on what happens with interest rates. So I'm not saying you can't make a lot of money. You can, you know, if you've ever seen like a pyramid scheme or going into a casino and you see somebody win big, you know, it's like, I, I want to get on that action. You just understand the risk that you're taking. So yeah. anyway, I, I hope that makes sense. I, I, I taught that in a class the other night and I think some people found it very useful. So I wanted to share it. Awesome. Uh, okay. Well, I think uh, we should wrap this up now. Is there anything else you want to say at the end? No, just appreciate the work you do. I appreciate you having me come in from time to time. It's fun having these chats. It's like it's fun talking to somebody that's like-minded, doesn't think I'm a lunatic because of all the things I'm concerned about. We're like-minded, but you take a different angle at this. And that's the reason I always enjoy uh, talking with you because I learn things from you. There's a lot of people that I have interviewed where I don't actually learn anything from them. And I always learn something from you. So well, I want to thank you that. for being here. And I want to remind everybody to like, subscribe, and hit that uh, notification bell. And we'll see you next time, Russ. Thanks. Thank you.